I like uh, talking with uh, fellow uh, alternative media people. Now, uh, your show is called yeah. uh, Church and State, which the, the reason that you called it that is because you want to empower Christians in the, the public debate. But your, policy, your discussions, they're mainly about policy issues. So uh, given that, why did you decide to call the show Church and State? Uh, well, there's a uh, really good intersection um, where Judeo-Christian values and teaching and, and moral principles um, intersect with, uh, with policy, with public policy. In fact, uh, I would argue and, and many people would agree that Judeo-Christian values are actually the strong foundation which has been proven successful by the flourishing nature of most Western democracies. Um, and it's actually the abandonment of those principles that are starting to see those societies and liberties being undermined. One of the, the key principles is the, the theological doctrine of imago dei, which means every one of us has the image of God. And that means every one of us should be treated equally with justice for absolutely everybody. Um, so the important thing is that you don't have to believe in God or be an adherent to a Christian faith to benefit from good ideas. Now, as a believer in God, I think God has some pretty good ideas, but I don't need to say Leviticus to be able to argue those ideas. And, and here's where the, the, the conflict happens, or the misunderstanding happens with a lot of lefties uh, who actually resent and describe a Christian participating in political debate as an imposition of beliefs. Uh, and that's just not the case because we live in a democracy. The only people that get to impose anything on anybody are the majority. So 50% plus one get to impose good or bad beliefs on the minority. There, there is no imposition other than when we're eroding freedom. So if I come and say Leviticus and fail to impress upon anybody the merit of, of uh, my views and, and policies that I'm espousing, they're not going to be persuaded, they're not going to vote for it, and there will be no imposition. But if I can come along and say, look, the the best interests of children and the erosion of freedom and, you know, the the ideal environment in which to raise a child are all sustained and promoted by traditional understanding of marriage, therefore we shouldn't, um, you know, muck around with natural institutions then some people will be persuaded by the logic and the merits of the argument, and I didn't need to mention Scripture at all. Now, the truth and Scripture should align perfectly all the time, and I'm very open to being persuaded that I'm wrong. So where church and state becomes the intersection that I want to explore is simply I want to explore good policy. I want to attempt to persuade people who disagree, and I want to listen to people who disagree, and that with an honest and intellectual approach to discussing what is best for our society, then we can together find truth. It's not about left or right winning, atheist or Christian. For me, I just want Australia to win, and I don't care if I have to change my mind in order for that to happen, or if I have to change somebody else's mind in order for that to happen. It's not about a personal victory or loss. Um, the truth is something that we should all be going for together. And sadly, that's the thing that seems to be most under attack these days, the, the concept that truth is fixed, constant and objective and discoverable. We've got this, even this phrase, your truth and my truth, as, as if it's subjective, which is complete nonsense. I mean, even even that assertion is a statement of of truth and so if there is no truth, how can you say there is no truth? Wouldn't there is no truth not be true? It's a self-defeating argument. Of course there's objective truth, and we need to be able to be honest enough um, and secure enough to face the fact that we might be wrong and not take it personally if somebody says you're wrong, that behaviour is wrong, that idea is wrong. Um, it's not a personal attack. It's a philosophical attack. Yeah, I definitely think that it's, you know, immature of people to, you know, just see the name, you know, church and state and say, you know, ooh, you know, the, this is this, you know, Christian person trying to, you know, in, impose their uh, beliefs. Because, uh, uh, like I said, your, your show, it does discuss uh, uh, serious issues, but uh, mm. like political issues, it's 
the ones that I've watched, it's there, there, there hasn't been, you know, much, much mention of, you know, uh, Christianity itself. But um, the reason why, for example, the Unshackled, we decided to remain a, a secular uh, website is because we wanted to be, you know, as close, inclusive as possible to mm. uh, p- people on the right, because but often when you do get into like theologic, theological debates, there can be uh, a lot of division. Like, for example, the, yeah. um, the anti-social justice warrior crowd, as, as I call them, who mainly exist on YouTube, like deep down a lot of them are hardcore atheists. And so if we start to you know, get into a debate about you know, Christianity versus you know, atheism, it sort of distracts us from the you know, main game, which is the, the threats to our freedom. And I certainly think that you're right that uh, you know, we should have an appreciation of you know, Judeo-Christian uh, values, but we, we, mm. we, we need to make sure that you know, we, we can understand that you know, we can disagree on you know, the existence of God, but still I realize there's a, there's a bigger picture here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and look, um, one of the popular problems in in even this discussion of of separation of church, freedom of religion, and, and a secular society is is misunderstanding all of those things from the beginning. And it's like we have to take it back to the beginning and say, whoa, 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 what do you even mean by secular? Now, most people that object to the presence of a Christian or a Christian thought in a in a secular debate is they they think that secular means French style secularism where Christianity, religion, faith, belief is completely excluded and expelled from public life. Uh, you're not allowed to mention God. You're not allowed to mention belief. You're not allowed to argue those things. If you're a teacher in a public school, a public servant, you're not allowed to even wear a cross. In, in the classroom or at, at work. It's uh, this complete exclusive secularism that goes on in France, which a lot of people think all secularism is, but it's simply not the case. That's not Australia, that's France. Now, in England, you have a, a different kind of secular, and, and that is where there actually is an official state religion of, of Anglicanism, the Church of England. And the Queen, is one of her titles is Defender of the Faith. Now, nobody's forced to be Christian in England, and they have very anti-Christian laws in, in there that conflict strongly with, with Bible teach. So there's no imposition of faith either. So there is an official religion in England, but there's plenty of atheists, agnostics, and, and Christians all mingling well to form that kind of secular society. In Australia, we have the third kind, and I think it's the best, and I like it, and I'm going to defend it. It's a pluralistic, inclusive, secular society. There, there is no state religion, but every idea, every worldview, every philosophy is welcome to put forward persuasive argument and to attempt to influence the debate for, for what they think is a good idea. And this is fantastic. We need a free market of ideas where nothing is given an advantage and nothing is excluded or limited or, or handicapped and nobody's going, oh, separation of church and state in this misunderstanding of, of what secular actually means. And uh, for the record, church and separation of church and state do not protect the government from religious idea and people with a moral compass. It's actually for protecting the church from the undue influence of, of government, which is what reference was to when jo- Thomas Jefferson uh, mentioned that in a, in a letter to a um, congregation of Baptists in uh, Danbury, Connecticut, way, way long ago. Separation of church and state doesn't appear in any law or constitution in either Australia or America. It's just a phrase that was in some private correspondence where those people were expressing concerns to one of the framers of their constitution and wanted to know were they going to be exposed to the same kind of tyranny and imposition of faith by the government um, which the pilgrims originally fled. The whole reason the American democratic experiment started was because they were looking for freedom of religion, not for protecting the government from religion, but for protecting the church from the government. And uh, so, yeah, an inclusive kind of thing that we need to understand. So I'm voting for, for secularism. And you talked about division that happens when people mention uh, 
you know, Christianity and does God exist or, or does he not? That's a separate, separate debate. It's a separate conversation. Um, when we're talking about policy, it doesn't matter. I have to persuade you that I think this law is good on the facts, the evidence, the data, the logic. And that's one of the reasons why, one of the two main reasons why I started um, my show, Church and State, was because I wanted to help Christians articulate good policy and even understand what good policy is uh, without having to reference scripture all the time. Because people who don't care about the Bible don't care about what the Bible says. The people who don't believe in God don't care what Leviticus says about anything. So the important thing is to say, well, here's this research, here's this study, here's this logical outcome when we, you know, we can, we can talk about economics or we can talk about uh, immigration or anything else. And, and yes, the Bible has a position and, a, and an approach for all of those things, but it has those, those positions for a reason. And, you know, there's a scripture that says, don't be conformed to the world, but be um, transformed by the renewing of your mind. God wants us to bring our mind to our faith, and not just to go, because the Bible says so. And it's that engagement of minds that, that we need to promote, and we need to be comfortable with. As conservatives, everybody right of center needs to be able to come to that debate and come to that conversation and articulate why they believe what they believe. And look, Christianity is just one form of belief. Atheism is enough. Buddhism is another. There's, there's this worldview and this approach that you have and bring to every debate. And to ask somebody to take out their heart or take out their experience or, or take out their convictions before they come to a debate, that's not secularism. That's totalitarianism dictating an imposition of, of beliefs. And no freedom, liberty-loving person should be in favour of that kind of exclusive secularism. This has been an Unshackled Fast. Please like, comment and subscribe. While you're here, grab our free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and visit theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.